Good morning, all. You're very welcome. We're just going to wait another couple of moments while we um, let all the participants join. I can see plenty of you still joining in there, so that's great. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, today's subject is on the area of change management and innovation. Um, and leading the sessions today, we have Podrick O'Kadig and Mark Campbell. Um, Podrick is probably best known um, as, as founder of Air Aaron, um, but he is a serial entrepreneur and has had a wide and varied range of experiences to share with us today um, from life in business, politics as a grail goer, community activist. Um, you've even been the subject of a Harvard Business School case study, Podrick. Um, and Mark then, Mark Campbell is a dear colleague of mine in the Graduate Business School in Griffith College. He's an author, a consultant and an SME owner himself. Um, he's very heavily involved in the management of our MBA program here in Griffith College and he's supervised hundreds over 500 um, MBA dissertations and projects um, with many of them with small businesses as well. Um, I have been privy to the preparation meetings between Podrick and Mark and they have been so interesting so I'm really looking forward to today's session and um, both of them bring such rich experiences um, and really really interesting content um, to today's session. Session. Their passion has been inspiring to listen to so far. Um, so an all-round pair of good eggs for you today. And I know both of them would love to hear from you. So please do use the Q&A function um, to ask any questions that you have throughout today's session. And the um, Podrick and Mark will answer them all as we go along today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Podrick to say a few words to kick us off. And then Mark will come in as well. So thank you all and see you soon. So, um, good morning, uh, Eilish and Mark and everybody watching and listening. Good morning, Mahagui. As I've done, could I hear from Lautly Martin? I will. I'll, I'll start off first of all by sharing with you that in this surreal time, this is going to be a surreal presentation. What I mean by that, it's a PowerPoint presentation, but the PowerPoint is in your head. In other words, you're creating the PowerPoints, uh, slides. And basically I'm going to help bring you through a number of those slides, those PowerPoint slides. For me, yeah, we're in a surreal situation. The world is different. We are not sure what it's going to be like on the other side. I'm going to share with you some of the strategies I use and people I know use in order to reinvent themselves, to bring themselves from the burning platform they're at now to a new destination, to where they want to get to and how you're going to get there. So first of all, the first slide, well, before we start the slides, this presentation is, there's twofold, there's two purposes to this. One purpose is, you yourself as an individual. So you can use those slides when you go for a walk within your two kilometer range and actually saying, how can those slides affect me as a person? And secondly, how does it affect me in my work, in my business, and what I do professionally? So the first slide is, where are you at right now? Or let's bring it back a little bit further. Let's join the dots. Where were you at? from a personal point of view and from a business perspective before this coronavirus surreal situation happened. And what has changed, both to you and to your business? What, was your, what did your platform look like? Going a bit deeper, looking at your secure base, Secure base is the solid foundation, the rock on which you build your life and build your business. Now, how solid was that before you got, we all got into this surreal coronavirus situation? Now, when you've thought through that and where you're at right now, Create a sense of the landscape. Where do you think it's going to be? Where's your landing pad going to be after all of this? 
So it reminds me of the times when I was involved in Air Iron, the airline. If you think about a pilot flying what we call VFR, that's visual, visual flying. They set their compass, they know where they're going, they start off the airplane, they take off, they're on a secure base, on the runway, they go up in the air. And they've got a compass and other tools and instruments to help give them, guide them broadly where they're going. That's giving them the orientation and the direction of where they're going to. As they get closer to their destination, they're actually fine tuning their instruments and the way they're flying. They're fine tuning it because of wind turbulence, because of height, because of maybe some other airplanes in the area, for whatever reason, they're actually reshaping and retuning and refining where they're going to land exactly. And then they know exactly what spot on the runway they're going to land, the wheels are going to come down on. And then they stop the airplane and they've landed. They're at their new secure base. I'm asking you and I'm challenging you, where do you see your new secure base? Where's your landing pad? After you actually use all the instruments and all the knowledge that you have, and then you decide which, which instruments are actually more relevant than the others. And what you're actually doing is you're building a bridge from where you're at to where you're going to get to. And that bridge is critical. That bridge can be weak, that bridge can be strong. What builds that bridge, the structure of that bridge is around two key areas. Where you want to get to, that means how long the bridge is. And secondly, the resources you have and you need in order to build that bridge. Resources are two areas, your people and your key assets. That's finance, other financial asset resources. So I, I've been a judge for entrepreneurial businesses and so on for a long number of years. People say companies grow. Companies, companies don't grow. People grow. So you want to create the environment that you've got the best team you possibly can working with you. And how can you create the environment within which those people can actually grow, express themselves, become leaders in their own right, and help build that bridge and make that bridge as solid and as strong as it possibly can make it. It reminds me years ago in Spittle, we were playing football, and that's all we had at that time, and GA and sport. And uh, we won the county final junior. That was about 15, 16, junior football. We trained like mad. And then we went senior, and we really trained hard for senior. We lost every game. Every game. Same guys, trained harder, same ball, same rule, same pitch. And it dawned on me, maybe about 15, 20 years ago, why we lost every game uh, senior. It's because not all junior players can actually play the senior game. That was a tough call for me. And how do you become a senior player? And the person who plays midfield on the junior team may be a sub, may play cornerback, may play in another, another position on the field or off the field as the case may be. So it's a matter of looking at your resources, looking at what resources you have, what resources you need in order to get to where you're at now and where you need to get to. And actually you're going to be calibrating like the pilot of an airplane all the way along as they're fine tuning to their landing pad. That's reinvention. It's also using the energy that you have and that's available to your disposal and using that energy to the best possible capabilities that you absolutely can. I'm going to get back to just two areas. And back in the day, I used to teach maths in a secondary school in Galway. And you remember the Venn diagram. And maybe perhaps I'm, I, I will 
leave you on this, but I'm available to answer, obviously, any questions if I can answer them after, after Mark's presentation. So you've got two circles. You've got you, yourself, and you've got your business. And they partially overlap, like in a Venn diagram. You, there's part of you that's outside of your business, outside of your work. You've got to really mind that, strengthen that secure base. There's also parts of your business that's a little bit distant from you, that you don't really have maybe a lot of control on, external environments, external issues. Like, for example, former airline I've been involved in, Air Iron, now Stobart Air, I was going into examinership there a week or so ago. City Chess, I've done the same thing last week because of the coronavirus and, and other external factors. So there's, there are wins there that are going to put you off track. And you've got to be, say, what can I control? What can I not control? What's within my level of control? Back to Stephen Covey, level of control and level of influence. And you looked in at the part in the middle between you and your business. Because you are not your business. There's a lot more to you than your business. And just finally, I'd say that um, there's a wonderful man from Derry called Richard Moore. And Richard, uh, Richard's in his late 50s now or so. And when Richard was 10 years of age, he was walking from primary school one day and he got shot in the face with a plastic bullet and he's, he's blinded. And Richard set up a charity called Children in Crossfire. No, I'm, I'm kind of involved, I'm involved in that charity. And they support kids all over, mainly Africa, in teaching primary school kids. And Richard met the British Army officer who shot him and forgave him and said to him, look at, but for what happened to me, I could not achieve what I, what I achieved, what he achieved. And Richard's patron is a, guy, is, is a person called the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama says, to Richard, or says Richard's the most compassionate person he ever met. And Richard and I think others would say that vision is everything. You don't have to have sight of the destination. It's all about vision. And doing what you can with whatever limited resources you have. I think we have a responsibility on that. And actually to go for it. So just in summary, where are you at now? This is the summary slide. Where are you at now? Where are you at before the surreal world happened? Both to you and to your business. Where do you want to get to? And you look at the landscape. You're the pilot of your airplane. Where's your landing pad? And then how do you build a bridge from where you're at to where you want to get to? What resources do you need? How do you build the team? What part of normal do you not want to get back to? Are there things you'd like to change? And now you may have an opportunity to do that change. Use your energy to the best effect, the 80-20 rule. And you and your business are not exactly the same. There's an overlap, but there's much more to you than your business. So perhaps Eilish and Mark, we might leave it at that, but I'm delighted to answer any questions if I can answer them. And Gornamila Mahagai, thanks for listening. That's great. Thank you so much, Podrick. Um, so Mark, if you're would like to come in there now and uh, I'd say Podrick for sure we'll be having some questions for you and a little bit more interaction in a little while. Okay thank you. Great um, thanks Edith and thank you Podrick for uh, that's a brilliant introduction and that, uh, what I hope to do is maybe share some ideas uh, based on working with uh, people in the area of change management and innovation uh, but very much building on what Podrick has already said there um, where do you see yourself starting off from? What kind of things do you need to do uh, to establish kind of where you are, uh, both you as a person and also where your business is? 
Uh, and uh, I'm going to share a few PowerPoint slides with you um, so that they might act as a little bit of a prompt. So when you're going on your two kilometer walk, uh, hopefully these might help you a little bit. There's a lot of detail on them, but what I would say to you is don't worry about the detail. We can, we can show them to you afterwards through the, through the course site, but maybe just try and capture some of the ideas as we go along, if you like. And the first thing I'm going to say is just as, as Patrick said, um, really where do we start from? Um, we, we know, for example, that uh, excuse me a second. We know that this has sort of appeared from almost nowhere. It's an uncontrollable event from our point of view. Um, we can only look after the bit that we can control and that we can manage. And we are, we do find ourselves on this kind of burning platform, if you like. Uh, and what tends to be the first reaction of people uh, when we're in this situation, I'm going to throw an old piece of theory at you here, the Kubler-Ross change curve, uh, because I think this applies in a situation like the one that we're in at the moment. Our initial action or reaction is almost shock, surprise, we didn't see it coming, or if we did see it coming, we didn't believe it was going to be this big. There's almost that denial stage, the disbelief of, you know, is it really true? Is it really going to happen? Us? Is this not something that was happening in China and Italy? Oh, it's arrived on our shore. Uh, now, we, you know, it's beginning to kind of really uh, begin to impact us. And now I'm kind of realizing that there's all sorts of government interventions and people telling me what I should do and shouldn't do. Among the many things there are, I should really close my business down, at least for a while. And I'm feeling a bit down, I'm feeling a bit anxious, I'm feeling a bit stressed about that. Um, so all of this stuff that's happening from a pandemic, uh, external to me, uh, uncontrollable by me, has suddenly put me into this kind of state. And we kind of have decisions about where we go from here. What do we allow ourselves to do? Uh, what do we allow to happen next? And what I would sort of say to you is just ask yourself, what mindset are you in today? probably two weeks or so ago when these webinars started, most of us are probably still in what I would kind of call the fear zone. We're kind of saying, um, you know, I, I really didn't see this coming. I'm standing on this burning platform. It's a sudden event. It's a car crash. You can use whatever analogy you want. And my normal business has gone out the, gone out the window. And you often find yourself expressing that. You get anxious. You're grabbing food. You're panic buying. You're complaining frequently. You're trying to firefight effectively but hopefully over the last couple of weeks we've moved a little bit into the learning zone we're kind of calming down a little bit we're kind of saying okay there's a problem here but like everything in business when we come across a problem we try to solve that problem we try to meet that problem uh, and we also realize that once we get over this initial problem once we kind of put a, a sort of an emergency plan in place and maybe an exit reopening plan in place that we can actually get our business back and start to grow it again so a bit like the, the sort of pilot who's heading out, we're kind of at that stage now where we can begin to kind of begin to plan, we can begin to kind of work out what direction we're going in and so on. So what we need kind of typically in a, in a change management process is to go through a number of kind of levels of, of I would call them strategy. Strategy is always kind of a, a big kind of high highfalutin Sunday world, but it really just means a, a response to uh, something that has happened to us. And depending on the type of business we, we are already in, depending on our robustness, our resilience, the resources that we have, and also depending on the level and the length of uncertainty we have, different strategies, one or two strategies that, we, that I've talked to you about this morning, uh, may be useful to you. But at the moment, I think most of us, bar a few businesses, are in this kind of emergency strategy stage. Uh, we're either closed down or if we are open, we're working within uh, a lot of restrictions. So now is an opportunity to kind of think back, uh, maybe think, well, there have been other crises before. Uh, our business and other businesses have got through them. There are first responders and even disruptors that have had success in the past. Yes, it is tough. We all have concerns, etc. But this is a real opportunity for us as a business and as a business person to respond. So when you're in an emergency, when you're stuck on a burning platform, it's an odd thing to do, but to stop yourself, uh, to take a deep breath, to pause and ask yourself, well, what are my main options here? Well, the first option is I can give up. I can just give up. That's the kind of scenario we don't want to do. Um, or I can sort of act normal. 
if I waited out a few weeks, sure, I'll be back at the normal type of business that I always did. And the messages we're getting are, are really sort of saying to us, for most businesses, that is not going to happen. Or I can look at it as almost a positive. In the face of adversity, do I use it almost as a propellant to get better, to make my business better, to make it stronger than before? And it can be a bit hard to be looking at that kind of longer term, you know, getting better, growing, etc., when we're looking at an emergency situation. So what we have to focus on in the next week or two or next three weeks is really an emergency strategy. But after that, then we can begin to look at an exit strategy as we begin to return to so-called normalcy. And then we can, as Podrick was saying, look at our resources, our assets and our people and begin to build on the capability we have and perhaps improve on that capability going into the future. So for now, it's important just to say to ourselves, look, there are very few businesses around us that have been able to continue as usual. There are obviously people in the medical profession who are, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're continuing as usually as usual, but they're very, very busy. So GPs, medical businesses, pharmacies, and certain limited businesses have been allowed to continue, food, retail, fuel, etc. And that has expanded a little bit since a couple of weeks ago. But even the most reliable, robust businesses, uh, even with the most certain scenario, they have to make changes. So we've seen, for example, the very, very rapid growth of home delivery services and click and collect services for fast food, uh, chippers, restaurants, cafes, and where pubs have an on license and an off license, in some cases where they've been able to separate that off license business, they've been able to open up again. And some businesses have quickly developed online or home working type of uh, facilities. So many administrative jobs, many professional jobs, not completely, but 80% of them, 70% of them can be done online. And we've seen some very, very good examples at primary and secondary and tertiary education, schooling and private training. There are people having yoga classes online, etc. So what I would say to you is there's lots of businesses around there, some of which have remained open, some of which are in a process of reopening, some of which are making small changes. And a first suggestion I would say as a response, an emergency response, is to scan the newspapers, talk to people, not face to face, but online or on the phone, find out what your other business partners are doing, ring your customers, it's probably a good time to do it anyway, ring your suppliers, start a conversation with them, find out what they're doing, how are they adapting, how are they changing. Often a small change is enough to maybe enable us to reopen, if not our entire business, at least part of our business. And I, I was speaking with Podrick and Elish a few days ago, just about a small example of a, a neighbor of mine who was involved in painting and decorating business. And, you know, if you sort of said to him, what, were, what are your resources, what are your assets, et cetera? He sort of said, well, it's basically, it's me, it's the ladder, it's a few pots of paint, some wallpaper, and I have a van that I can uh, use and I can rely on. Uh, but what happened a few weeks ago was people sort of said, I really don't want you coming into my house to paint my walls. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, it became, I don't even want you around the outside of my house painting the exteriors. Um, so suddenly he had a, a, a demand uh, that, that dried up in the space of a couple of weeks. Uh, and he began to think about what do I do today? And he was kind of feeling a bit depressed. He started cleaning out his van and then he suddenly realized that he had a big empty space in the back of a van. And I said, well, if I can't work, I'll go and volunteer. There's lots of people need meals delivered, etc., around the place at the moment. I have a van, I know how to drive. Okay, I'm, I'm trained as a decorator. That's what I, I did my time in. Um, but I have this van, I have this driving skill, I have this other skill. I'm going to now go and adopt that. And he went off and volunteered, started making deliveries to people. And now in the last couple of weeks, what has happened is he was in a center store the other day. He was picking up a delivery to deliver to a, a vulnerable home. And the person who owned the central store said, um, you know, who's paying for your petrol? And he said, well, nobody. I'm kind of doing this off, off, off the bat. I'm putting the diesel in the van. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, we, we don't actually have a delivery van ourselves. We don't have a delivery person. For the next few weeks, why don't you come and work for us? We'll pay for your fuel. Uh, you can send us in an invoice every week uh, to cover your costs. And we we'll pay you a little bit extra on that. So his business has now changed very, very quickly from being a direct a decorator, painter, 
uh, which he very much enjoyed to be the delivery person. Um, it's not ideal, but what does it do? It means he can keep paying the lease on his van, keeps meaning that he has a salary, uh, he has some kind of income, he's kept busy. Um, so his emergency strategy, if you like, is small and simple. Uh, but there are many, many other things out there that can be done uh, in this emergency kind of stage. And some of the people speaking in the previous webinars have mentioned the importance, for example, of scanning what's online in terms of government supports. So looking at microfinance uh, on Enterprise Ireland, the local enterprise office, the bank websites, et cetera, to find out what exactly is needed uh, to keep me going through this emergency period. Big, big focus. If any of you attended the, the webinar on, on Thursday, I think it was of last week with Suzanne and Mark McEnroe and Laura, etc., talking about the importance of liquidity and cash flow. What are the things that you can do to keep your business liquid and how can you ensure that you get an injection of working capital into the business? So there's lots of things that can be done as an emergency strategy. This is really just a strategy to keep your business as open as possible, if that is possible. It probably won't mean the entire business, but it might mean part of it. And it might mean looking at the competencies and the resources that you have as a person or that your team have and ask yourself, is there something that we can do in the short term to keep the business going, to keep it open or semi-open and to get some cash flow in so that we actually keep our, uh, our business, if you like, solvent and keep it uh, there and protected for the next stage. And there may be some businesses that actually seriously are beginning to say at this stage, I'm not going to be able to reopen. I'm not going to be able to do the types of things that I should normally do for six months or 12 months or 18 months. And in those cases, don't be afraid to think about the big thing of looking at an examination. Because what that gives you is some protection for your assets, some protection for your cash flow, some protection for your staff to some extent. Um, there may be an ability to hold off from creditors looking for money uh, to protect your business and uh, effectively keep you going through that emergency stage. So just one more slide here, and maybe, um, Podrick, if you're still around, uh, or Eilish, uh, maybe you might come in on this. But I, I think just for, for the next couple of weeks, a few things to kind of think about. Take a deep breath. Remember that you and your business are not the same. You're, you're two separate entities. Uh, when you're going on your two kilometer walk, take as many deep breaths as are necessary to calm yourself down. And then when you are calm, start looking at the COVID financial and other supports. Focus on thinking about how do I keep my business liquid? How do I keep the cash flow going? Uh, if necessary, that might mean looking at debtors and creditors, and you probably need to start contacting your customers and your suppliers, the people who give you inputs. And if you are going to go and ask for help from your local enterprise office or your bank or get the help of your accountant or your tax person, um, they're all going to ask you the same question. Have you got a budget? Have you got a cash flow plan? Do you have some sort of business plan? Not a big deep document, but some kind of thing on paper that sort of says, how am I going to trade out of this mess that we've all found ourselves in? And possibly we may need to decide a bit like our painter decorator friend, that the old business model of painting and decorating maybe isn't gonna work for a while. And in the short term, I have to change my business, use my assets, whatever way I can. And um, develop an outline financial model. And if you're really running into trouble, even after you've done all of those kind of uh, stages, think about examinership, but don't act on it. Just have it there as a kind of a, fall, a fallback if, if things don't work out. And the two things I would sort of say overall are get informed and, and keep informed. So there's some em emergency strategy type things, if you like to do. And I think after that, we can maybe have a look at some of the, the other strategies, but maybe just to kind of focus on that for a moment, maybe uh, if you don't mind, Podrick, if you're still there, um, I'd love to kind of get your points on, um, you know, how can people, how can business people deal with the emergency strategy, the things that they need to do over the next two or three weeks, maybe, um, you know, uh, you've been through some ups and downs with businesses uh, in the past and you've advised on people, you've heard lots of stories over the years of different people. And I know from talking to you over the last couple of weeks, <laughs> um, just mentioning kind of 
that separation of business and person, but also kind of that need to protect whatever it is you have. I think for these next few weeks, while we're still in that kind of lockdown or semi-lockdown, um, just wondering if you have any thoughts. On, uh, on, okay, on Mark. No, thank you. And, and thanks for that. It was very, very insightful, very helpful. All I can do is share my own experience, openly and honestly with you. Uh, I put my heart and soul into building an airline. My background was not in aviation. Actually, my background is in teaching and accountancy and law. And I, I put everything, everyone, people call it, that's your baby. And, and it probably was. And the company went from zero to about 120 million turnover in about five years. Uh, grew really, really fast. We won a whole lot of awards and so on. And awards are, are nice, but they're only trophies at the end of the day. But they are nice. It, it's nice to get them. It gives, gives you a sense of impetus. And the airline actually was growing faster than Ryanair for a couple of years. And all of a sudden we were on the radar and a couple of things happened. One is my health got affected. I was getting blackouts. I didn't tell anybody about it. So the, share, the story I shared with you, or the, the PowerPoint presentation I shared with everybody who's watching and listening was very much from a personal point of view, but I said it back in an objective sense rather than a personal sense. This is the personal side of it coming out. And Ryanair went after me because they saw me as some form of a threat. We hit a recession in 2007, eight, and we were really struggling. And the worst thing was that tip topped us over. Believe it or not, something I'd never even thought of was volcanic ash in Iceland. Imagine an eruption on a mountain in Iceland closed down about 30% of all regional airlines in Europe. You cannot plan for that. Now I'm sharing that with you for you in the context of today. Where are you at? I put the company into examinership because I knew it was a great company with great people. And if anybody asks me, what was your greatest success in business? My single greatest success was that not one person lost their job during that examinership time. Now, I was fortunate, I was lucky in that. The other thing I'd say, and I'm using this, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this, your secure base. I had a secure base around me. I had an amazing family, an amazing wife and family that were there with me through thick and they believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. So what's your, do you have a secure base? And the other thing I felt was, I felt I was a failure. And that's a, that's a kind of a difficult space to be in. And, and I felt I was a, I was a failure because other, I thought other people saw me as a failure. And then I realized the difference between a kick in the arse and a pat in the back. Don't write that down your slides, you can remember that. And the difference between a kick in the arse and a pat in the back is six inches. That's it, six inches. So I stopped feeling sorry for myself. I started building from the secure base. And I started working like hell again. And you know what happened to me? I got a heart attack. My heart stopped, it catches my breath, I was clinically dead. And they got me back. There's a million to one chance that I survived it. And that kind of started kick-started me probably changing my life, not overnight, but gradually. So that's why I put the Venn diagram up on that slide. There's you, and Mark, you very well referred to it. There is you and there's your business. You are not your business, your business is not you. You've got totally different purposes. The most important thing to get through this, the most important aspect to get through this is you yourself. You stay alive. Somebody told me once, look, if your business can keep breathing, you have a chance of survival. But it's also so important. As John Wayne said in one film, I forget the name of it. When you're on a dead horse, the best to do is get off. 
So you got to realize, you got to call a spade a spade. And then you move on to something else. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is good, provided you learn the lesson and you say, I'm going to move on. But do not start feeling sorry for yourself or feeling saying, this happened, but for this, but for that. Look, at it happened. And you take it on the chin and you say, okay, what can I do with the resources I have? I mentioned Richard Moore. He was blinded at the age of 10. And he went and he thanked that British Army officer. And you know what the British Army officers asked him? He said, will you do me a big favor? Richard said, yeah, what is it? He said, well, I can understand if you'd say no. And Richard says, well, tell me. He says, will you give the eulogy in my grave? And Richard said, I'd be honored to do so. There are things that are deeper and more important than business and all that out there. Your business has a role, it's got a function. You do it, you do your best to enjoy it, and you look to reinvent yourself. Like that, Mark, that story, Mark, it's a simple, straightforward story about that guy who's a painter, decorator. And all of a sudden, he's got, he's got a new business that he can get involved in. There's always things we can do, provided you can breathe and you can get, you get your health. Because I almost lost mine. And I'm very, very privileged to have it. Mm. So that's just my story, but it's there actually, to be honest with you. So I was listening carefully to support the points you made there, Mark. And uh, thanks for bringing me in. I hadn't planned to say this, but that's a live TV, as they say. <laughs> that's great. Well, thanks. That. That's really brilliant, Patrick. Because I think, you know, we often have that thing of, and I remember my early days working in a consulting firm, you know, who was at the time in the late 1980s and early 90s, when the places gone bust left, right and centre. And as a, a kind of graduate out of college, I kind of, I always kind of separated business from people. I never thought that they would uh, get overlapped. And I always remember that the anguish on people's faces and even the, they would bring the whole family into the office. And it was like, it was like a funeral, you know, the death of our friend, the business type of thing. Now, this is more, I know we mentioned examinership or examination there. That I always see as a very good way of actually protecting businesses in the short term. A little bit more difficult when you get into receivership because you're losing some control of yeah. your business. And then liquidation, you've effectively kind of said, look, you know, get get everything into cash form. And suddenly the, you know, the laptop that you that you carried around with you and that has all your databases and all your notes on it, suddenly there's a there's a liquidator kind of selling it off for hundred euros as part of a package and you're done. But I need that to you know. But I think to separate yourself out and bring bring it back to what do I have or what does my team have? And you mentioned the importance of the team and uh, being able to keep everyone in employment, et cetera. I think those are really, really important. And also keep obviously looking after your family and your the immediate friends that you have around you as well. Mm. It's, a, mm. it's really important to emphasize that, I think. Mm. And That's to recognize, true. I think, that you are in an emergency situation in the first few weeks, maybe even the first few months for some businesses. Um, and in an emergency, we, we get all those kind of negative feelings and we have, we end up with bad mental health, bad physical health often as, as a result of it because it's just so stressful on us. Um, mm. and, and the more we can kind of recognize, look, this is just a, a stage that we're going through. We are going to want the next stage after this, um, you know, once we can get through this and, and what we need to do is kind of shore up and protect as best we can. Um, in the business, you know, the assets, the liquid, the money, but we need to kind of look after ourselves and our families as well, because it's a really key part of, of change management. If we're not well, we can't do anything to help the business. So. Yeah. Mark, um, I remember Ivan Yates asking me a question a number of weeks ago on, on one of his news talk programs. I didn't expect it. It's a live program. And he said to me, what advice would you give to your 18 year old self? It's a question people ask, but I didn't expect it. And, I, I suppose I said, Ivan, there's two parts to that answer. One is give life the best shot you can. You know, give it 100%. Mm. And the second thing is, do not be too hard on yourself. Mm. Most of us are way too hard on ourselves. We'd actually achieve a lot more if we were not as hard on ourselves. I actually have a big, I have a big issue with a lot of people saying, reach for the stars. Mm. Go as far as you can. I said, no. Go 80% of the way. And, and when you get that, say, take a break. It's like mm. climbing a mountain. Yeah. Let's say you pick a mountain 
or a big hill someplace, I don't know, wherever, in Connemara, Mount Everest, I don't mind. And you start, you cannot see the top of that mountain. So you cannot, because it's all covered in fog. So you say, you decide, and actually, this is the route I'm going to take. Go and kill Manjaro, I'm taking the whiskey route or, or, or mm. whatever. Mm. This is the route I'm taking. And I'm actually going to go and I'm going to climb to this height, maybe six, 700 feet. And think about this about your life and your business and say, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to take a breather. Mm. I have enough energy to go further, but no, I'm going to conserve my energy. I'm just going to go six, 700 feet. And when you get there, there's a plateau and you look around and you enjoy the scenery. Take a breath or two, relax. Get the rest of your energy back. Maybe you might camp there for the night and then go to the next stage. Do the same and the next stage. And it's only when you come closer to the top that you actually see exactly where the top of the mountain is. Yeah. That's a little bit like vision. We can only, we can see so far. And when you get to there, take a breather, then you look at the next stage and then you look at, and you know what happens when you get to the top of that mountain? You say, wow. What scenery? What do people like me and business people have done in the past? We'd straight away and said, I haven't time to look at the scenery. I want to climb the next biggest mountain. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I, I, um, I, I, I did a, I'm an alumni of, 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 of Harvard and, and, and I, I went there, I paid for this thing and I, I couldn't afford to go there when I was a kid. My parents were working class, so I, I, I didn't go. And I always said, I'd love to go there if I get a chance. And I, I got there anyway. And there was a professor of strategy. You'd like this, Mark. A lady called Cynthia Montgomery. She was a class act, wonderful lady, wonderful, wonderful lady. And Professor Cynthia Montgomery. And I don't know if she's still teaching there or not. But she, they used to write on a, on a, on a, blackboard actually whiteboard blackboard and she says how do you define your strategy what can you give me one sentence or what tells you whether you have a good or a bad strategy we were all coming up with all kind of fancy answers says, no, hold on a second and she wrote on the blackboard the world with you versus the world without you mm -hmm. i'm asking all of us me Eilish, mark Everybody who's listening, what is the world with you versus the world without you? I've got a whiteboard in a small office I've here at the side of the house. And I've written up on it, the world with me versus the world without me. Do I make any difference? Does your business make any difference? And when you're moving from the burning platform you're on that you and I spoke about, Mark, to where you want to get to, does where you're going to land, is that going to make a real difference? And how can you create the environment where it actually does make a real difference? Mm -hmm. So maybe if there's one slide from me that you, you take with you is, what is the world with you versus the world without? And you don't have to change the world. Mm. Just change yourself. Yeah, yeah. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> there's some very good thoughts there, I think. Yeah. I, I think that's really worthwhile. What, what you know, what is the world with me? What is it without me? It's a very simple thing. And if you, if you, if you find you have a blank on, on one side, then you're in trouble and you need to do a bit more thinking, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks I might intervene, um, if you yes. don't mind, guys. I, it's mm -hmm. fascinating listening to you. But we have got a few questions um, coming in um, and also lots of comments about how, how, how much the participants are enjoying it. Um, Jerry asked a question from when you were talking about examinership. Um, now, I think probably you've, you've addressed it since but Jerry let me know if you, if you want them to revisit that he was just talking about the fear I suppose of, of examinership and, and would it perhaps look bad or, and scare away suppliers or banks and, and all the rest of it when you come out the other side um, but I think you spoke very well to, to the point of it, it, have it in your back pocket as you said Mark it's not necessarily yeah. to enact it. I think in the emergency stage that's the key thing have it there have it ready it's a fallback position it's really, you know, and as you say in your back pocket, if you really fall on your, excuse my language, if you fall on your arse, it's there to offer you a little bit of protection, you know. And I think we're going to see so many examinations over the next few months and years. 
that it's going to become a bit normal. It's a bit like in the last recession, you remember everyone kind of went, oh, and solve personal insolvency, you wouldn't do that, you know. You remember there used to be this, like, you had to wait about 20 years, what was it, kind of, you got, you had to wait a very, very long period before you could go into a personal insolvency. And we, all our mindset changed very, very quickly to say, yeah, no, it's acceptable. You have to be able to walk away from your, your debts, whether it's your mortgage, your personal mortgage, your, your business loans or whatever. And our attitudes change. And I think that will happen with examination this time around as well. Yeah, can I can I just yeah can I come in there as well, uh, Elish? Because I I went Please, through that yeah. process, and I know a lot of people a lot of people who did, and Mark, one hundred percent, there is nothing wrong with going into examinership, and uh, I don't is it Jerry Elish who asked the question? Yeah, Jerry, look at Jerry. Uh, your creditors will actually appreciate you being upfront and honest with mm. them, and mm. saying, look, at, I want to work with you. I want us to continue a relationship, but we need to restructure this business if this business is going to survive. And if you've had a good relationship in the past with your creditors, uh, 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 Jerry, which I'm sure you've had, that's going to stand by you. I haven't come across one creditor. I have not one who caused serious issues about it. So they haven't. Uh, in one case, two cases, they, need, they appreciate getting some money if they can get it. But more importantly, them is a long-term relationship. The long-term business relationship is really, really important. What really annoys people is if somebody isn't upfront and honest with them and doesn't, I'm not saying pull the plug, does not restructure early enough. That's the biggest mistake we can make. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, brilliant. Thank right. you. And then Aoife, who's been um, with us throughout our webinar. It's great to see you again, Aoife. Um, so Aoife's is a second generation um, furniture store and they have been tipping away online with smaller stuff, smaller sales, but they have, you talk about resources um, that you have. Well, they've got warehouses with lots and lots of bigger stock for customers. Um, so trying to innovate, Aoife had come up with a plan with couriers to get the stock to customers' doors. Um, but they're quite a high-end service business as well. So they've always done that, bringing them in and setting up the furniture. Um, so customers aren't happy with the to-the-door service, which is all, uh, understandable. Um, but she also doesn't know when she's going to be able to get into their houses again. So mm. it's a really tricky, rock and a hard place situation. Um, so it's not so much a question as a throwing it out there, any solutions, you know, or, or strategies for trying to, to rethink um, and innovate, I suppose, she's looking for a little bit of inspiration. Yeah, uh, can, I mean, can I come in there? Sorry. Yeah. Um, if we look at the landscape, if we're going forward, overall, what our lives are going to be like, there's going to be some fundamental changes. And I believe one of them is more and more and more online and interactiveness online. And in other words, I'm saying the, the personal touch is not going to disappear. But in actual fact, more and more of us are getting much more familiar and much more comfortable with buying stuff online. Mm. You know, um, so I believe that if you can have and use this downtime to actually create the best interactive website you can for your online furniture and, and kind of semi 3d going around and looking at the furniture from all angles and actually creating maybe a a sense of a design and somebody actually interactively says puts the uh, the couch in this room in this corner with this color and so on that actually is creating a link and an engagement which i think will only help your business going forward uh so i'm just suggesting research in that area and and, and actually creating the interactiveness as much as you can yeah, I, I was going to add something more or less along the same lines. I mean, obviously you can't install and screw together the furniture for people, but mm. maybe giving them a remote service where they have somebody who talks them through the process in the short term might be a kind of another solution to take. I think, unfortunately, this is one of those cases, though, where the COVID restrictions are probably going to limit what you can do to, to everything being online for the next few weeks. But I think that's going to be a relatively short period for businesses like that. I, I, I can see you know, uh, people being allowed to assemble. The other thing is maybe to to see, you know, what what maybe have a, a, a chat with the local guardi or whatever to sort of see what is possible, what is not possible. You know, if I'm in a separate room in the house installing or, or, or you know, putting together the furniture, uh, but the family are off somewhere else, you know, can, can there be some kind of uh, more local within the house quarantine restrictions 
uh, that could be put in place. I don't know if that's feasible, but maybe just try, trying out a few things like that uh, in, in your mind might be worth worthwhile, you know? Yeah, they're all great, great suggestions. Um, Caroline has um, a question for you, Podrick, then, and it's, it's more, I suppose, about uh, reigniting the fire. So Caroline has had a really tough uh, number of months pre-COVID. Um, so the back end of 2019, she was involved in a car accident. She was hospitalized with an illness. So basically, she, she had a really, really stressful time. Um, and now with the current situation, she just feels completely flat. She just doesn't feel she has the enthusiasm um, to bring back her passion for her business. Um, so she's, you know, wondering if you have any insights into how maybe you might have had similar experiences in the past. You, you mentioned your, your, your health issues as well um, and how you build back up that passion. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Caroline. A couple of things. Uh, one is I, I realized that it took me a while. I realized that if I keep going down the road, I was going, all I was doing was going to a state of depression. And what was that doing? That was really hurting the relationship I was having with people who mean most to me in life. And I started asking myself, do they deserve that? And that's what started me saying, Porik, will you cop on to yourself? You know, and the kick in the arse versus the pat in the back works in reverse as well. In other words, Caroline or, or, or whoever, whoever is listening to this and interested in this part of it out there, don't be always giving yourself the kick in the arse. Give yourself a bit of pat in the back. You're alive, you can breathe. I don't know, obviously, exactly what Caroline went through. But I remember when I was, I knew I was, I knew I was, I knew there was something wrong with me. I didn't know I was having a heart attack. And I got as far as the car on Galway. And I said, if I can get to the car, I can get to a doctor. If I can get to a doctor, maybe can they do something for me? And what happened, a guy actually saw me in the car and he drove my car to the hospital. Now, so the closer I get to the hospital, the better chance I got. If you're still alive, you, you've still a fighting chance. So don't, don't ever, 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 ever give up. It's not worth it. You deserve more. You deserve better. But do not put too much stress or pressure on yourself in relation to achieving. I was told, I used to run marathons. I ran the New York Marathon three times. I ran blasted stuff like that. And, and, I was told when I was leaving the hospital, try and walk five minutes a day, Porik. I said to myself, that doctor's crazy. I want to run five miles a day. I found it more difficult walking five minutes a day than I did running the New York Marathon. But I did it. And Caroline, you can do it. Any of us. If, if a man from Connemara can do it, anyone can do it. You know, so walk the five minutes. And you know, within no time, you'll be walking 10 minutes. And in no time, you'll be walking 20 minutes. And you just keep going on. Richard Moore would be one of my heroes. And I mentioned him before. Look him up, Children and Crossfire. And you will see how grateful he is for everything in life. And just say, thank God, or whatever, whoever your God is, that you are, and just keep going. And you don't have to rock the world and shake the world. I thought I had to make big difference in the world. No, you don't. Just make small difference in your own life. I, 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 or Eilish, I called you that before, Bronner. <laughs> I, I, I hope that I hope that's helpful. That's great. Yeah, that's that's really good, and and hopefully that helps Caroline and, and probably lots of others listening who who have similar experiences. You know, I think it's hard to get your mindset right. Um, you know, we're so, we're several weeks in, um, and and now is when people start to waver and start to really mm -hmm. uh, to struggle. Um, so trying to get that mindset to be kind to yourself um, and give the pat on the back um, rather than the kick in the arse. I think it's yeah. it's really important to do. Yeah. Um, now Sinead is coming at us with a really deep and meaningful question. Question, which she's asked the three of us to answer. Sinead, I literally heard this for the first time today as well. So I've written it down and I'm going to think about it later. Um, so I won't answer it now. Um, but Sinead wants to know what we think is, or how would we explain the world with us versus the world without us? Uh, so Patrick, you've given that plenty of time and reflection. So I'm going to let you <laughs> take that one. <laughs> oh my good God. Uh, 
first of all, I'm delighted you've picked up on the world with you versus the world without you. I think to me personally, it's, it's, it's the most important message I can share. So it is by far just that sentence. If you just keep that slide. I, I, first of all, I, I don't set a lot of goals. I set a small number of goals. It's the 80, 20 rule, but those small goals can make a big difference. So, let me give you an example. It depends on the circumstances you're in. And all I can do is speak for myself. When I was in the Shannad, there were two key areas that I focused on. And the vast majority of people in the Shannad, they, all, they talk about anything and everything. It doesn't matter. They see what's in the paper and they talk about it. I said, no, I'm going to focus on two areas. I'm going to focus on SME, small and medium-sized business and entrepreneurship. And I'm going to focus on our language and our culture and our heritage and who we are as a people, our uniqueness in being Irish. Nothing wrong with anyone else or other countries, fair play to them, but we've got, there's something special and unique that we have, which we love sharing with people and let's do it. So my focus was on those two areas and can I make a difference in those areas? Can I make a difference in those areas? And that was it. So right now, and you look at it from your professional business perspective and you look at it from your, from your personal perspective. So the business perspective, professional, and your, your personal. And then in personal, quite frankly, we're, well, hopefully we'll be finishing a house soon. Uh, it's locked down at the moment, obviously. And my big focus is on that so we can move in there as quickly as we possibly can. Um, thankfully, more fundamental differences um, would be, thank God, touch wood, like if, if there's somebody in family that was sick or ill, I'd say, well, what can I do to help them? The whole world doesn't need to know. It's not like the Shannon where it's a pretty public forum. So you don't have to, the world with you versus the world without you. There's two areas. There's the personal side and the professional side. And I set a small number of goals in each one of them. And more often than not, they're long-term. And probably the most important word that's not in that the world with you versus the world without you in order to make that difference is the word no. And I was poor at that. And one of my best friends would say to me, Porik, what part of the word no do you not understand? Because that means you're scattered all over the place. You're doing everything for everybody at all times. And you're not really, really focused from your point of view. So, Shunemisha. Thank you very much. I yeah. hope uh, that was of use. Uh, Mark, do you want to tell us yours? <laughs> well, Man, Mark. Much confession, this is yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, really, I, I like, hope this has been reported. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> no, I would say, I mean, something that's similar to mine, a health issue, but, but not physical so much, but as mental health, suffering from depression a number of years ago, and I took time off work, and I did all the things that the doctor said, you know, go off walking, go off hiking, and like that, I was building up, and I remember one particular day being about two-thirds up, two thirds of the way up the mountain up here near us, pelting down in the middle of a snow, not a snowstorm, but a hailstorm. And I'm kind of going, I'm coming out here day after day and walking up this hill or some other hill and I'm really not getting anywhere. And actually I just felt, I was at the stage of, I'd love to just curl up, you know, in, in, in the ditch here and, you know, someone can find me in a few hours time. I'd probably have died of hypothermia, but it doesn't really matter. And that very question of what would the world be with you and without you came came to my mind. I'm mean, going to start thinking about family and ridiculous things like who would walk the dog and you know, all that type of thing. You suddenly realise that no matter how small your yeah. your 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 place is in life, that there's something there, you know. And you could take that analogy through to to business as well. Sorry to bring think, commerce into such a, a deep kind of discussion, but you know it's the same type of thing. When you when you're really really down, you have to kind of think of. But what are the kind of small steps that I can begin to to think about, you know? And I was talking a few minutes ago about an emergency strategy, you know, but we're getting to a stage now where, okay, we haven't reached the top of the curve. We've managed to flatten the curve and all those phrases. But now should be the time that we're beginning to think like, you know, what is the exit strategy going to be? You know, this, this lockdown, okay, we don't have a definite date yet, um, but we have some rough dates and we, 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 we are going to see some relaxation. Uh, we don't know when that will be, and it will be different for different businesses. So for some people, maybe the 3rd of May might be might be a next step up. For other businesses, it's going to be a week after that. 
for you know for the airline business by the sound of it they're planning on the basis of the 17th of june kind of as a startup date again uh, now that may move forwards backwards who knows you know but it's a date and it's a good idea to kind of give yourself a date and a step to work towards in a way it doesn't matter if that date shifts because you then have your plan you know what your next steps are and i think that's really the important thing you know from a business point of view i think get yourself right personally first and, and your state of mind uh, and really kind of work out what you contribute in your personal capacity but i think also then as Patrick says it's the business capacity and the professional capacity there's a lot of people out there that maybe they don't rely on you but they like you to be there, you know what I mean? I, I mean, I'm teaching to groups of people, you know, they say they should online and offline in classes every day. And you kind of sometimes get fed up with it and you're a bit bored with it and all that kind of thing. And then you sort of say, what would happen if I didn't turn up for that lecture? Mm. The little bit of information that would be missing, mm. the bit of knowledge or something that might make the difference between someone getting a good degree or a poor degree or, or you know, someone that you're supervising their dissertation as a research student mm. and you're not there to answer a quick question that they have, a doubt that they have, you know. Um, and the, the more you can think of those things, I think the better it is. And, and in fact, your strategy in a way should emerge out of that, your personal way forward, your professional way forward, your business way forward. It shouldn't be based on kind of what do other people want in a sense. It should also be based to a large extent on what do I want to do. And, you know, um, because you can go around saying yes to everybody uh, and that can keep you a, a very, very busy fool. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get on and that you progress in life, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My mantra is always, I can do anything, but I can't do everything. So yeah. that kind of <laughs> yeah. prioritizing and making yeah. choices. Um, mm -hmm. And now I find that the, those lists are overlapping because you're working yeah. from yeah. home. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so you've got kids work. And um, mm -hmm. so everything is met, met kind of all coming in together mm -hmm. um, and just trying to prioritize what can I do? What has to be done? Um, mm -hmm. And kind of being kind again. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. So we're going to go back to a bit more practicalities in the questions um, after that lovely reflection. I hope that uh, answered your question so much, Sinead. Um, so Lorraine is asking about the kind of impact on retail. I mean, you've uh, talked a little bit there, Mark, about the timelines and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, so she's asking, can you see retail fallout? And yeah. Jerry as well is asking, again, he'd love to get the, um, your views, guys, on the working landscape post crisis you know in particular do you think we're going to see a lot more remote working a lot more demand for those hubs that were being talked about um and Padraig, you probably have a bit of knowledge of that you know with the sme focus that you had in the in the in the senate that they were talking about establishing these kind of hubs weren't they um so will that be happening more will we see greater decentralization of business yeah i I think actually, I mean, to, to take the Rain's question first about the retail fallout, mm. I do think there will be some fallout, uh, but I think this is part of a trend that has been ongoing for many, many years. We've been talking about, I hate the phrase, the death of the high street. I, I see it as a reconfiguration of the high street and things like that. Um, you know, just as high streets have been, been closing down or, or changing in function to having more service uh, cafes etc the out of town malls have been growing up uh, if i can call it that uh, and obviously the online retail so that's a shift that was happening anyway um and i think you know this has just kind of added fuel to the fire a little bit and one of the great uh, strategists that's around at the moment a guy called richard rummelt uh, he's done a lot of work on in fact recessions and and how businesses have come out of recession and use kind of strategy to help them and one of the things he says is not every recession, but some recessions have what he calls uh, structural changes. Uh, and this might be one where a structural change, unfortunately, happens in retail. Um, and you really need, I think, you know, put the cards on the table here. It's a bit like Project was saying with examination. You know, I'm, I'm being up front here. I think some high street businesses, retail, will go to the wall um, unless they do very, very innovative things with their stores. Uh, I think I can see out of town still growing for the next while, but I can certainly see that the long term trend is going to be for online, not for everything, but for an awful lot of things, things that we we trust as be, or think of as more commodities. Um, we still need showrooms, but maybe they, they need to go online. So what I would say to, to Lorraine is, yes, I think there is actually going to be some fallout from from this, some short term, um, but I think it's just an acceleration of a longer term trend. That may be bad news to some people who are listening today and who are joining us today, but that would be my viewpoint. And I think, you know, there comes a point in your life when you have to say, look, 
that is what's happening. That's the uncontrollable bit that I, you know, I can do a certain amount to react to that. Maybe I need to decide to maybe move my store or change it or move it more online or whatever it is. I have to adapt to the new reality. And that's the important point. No matter what the change is, that we, we try to meet it and adapt for, for it. Um, I think the same thing is going to be true of sort of teleworking, homeworking, homeworking hubs as well. I think a lot of people have realised both the benefits and the disadvantages of homeworking over the last while. But in a way, we were kind of thrown into it and people are around the kitchen table and, you know, in our household here, we're fighting for broadband all the time and we're, I want to use this room and I have a conference call and, you know, we're nearly kind of at each other's throats sometimes, you know, and I would say that they're probably listening. Right? <laughs> but, you know, it's, that's the reality. But you can't homework like that all the time. You, you need to then think about, look, if, if I'm going to be homeworking long term, then I do need maybe if I'm lucky enough to have a back garden, I need to get one of those little showmers or whatever it is so that I can separate again the personal and the business life or I put the, you know, when I, if, if Project's building an extension, I'm sure you have somewhere in your house, some kind of an office or some kind of office space in the, in the new environment, you know, and that's going to be very, very important, I think, for people because, you know, everyone's sitting around the table, with, you know, homeschooling going on at one end of the kitchen table and someone trying to have a serious conference call with their boss at the other end and maybe someone doing an interview online in the, in the, in the middle. Uh, that's not going to work. So we have to adapt and change to it. But I think definitely a trend. Um, but I would see it as a good thing and a positive thing. I mean, you see the positives out of it in terms of people being able to spend more time with family. And, you know, I, th I think that's been great. I mean, when I go for my short walks around the house, just to see the number of parent children interactions around the various housing estates and things. And they're just out doing normal things, walking, cycling, hitting a ball with a hurley, kind of, you know, um, it, it's all there. Yeah. So. That's great. Thanks. And Patrick, do you want to come in on that, on the kind of what post-crisis, what um, the working landscape might be? Yeah, I, I, I'll go micro first and a little bit macro very briefly. One is, uh, you ask yourself, uh, what, what are you selling? Is it a commodity? In other words, are you a price taker or a price maker? And if you're a price taker, in other words, other people decide the selling price of your product. It's a pretty difficult position to be in. You're effectively selling a commodity. So you've got to get yourself again, the world with you versus the world without you in this area. Can you create a product or a service that's in demand and you've got some control over the pricing? That's really, really, really important. So if you're in Main Street retailing, I think I, with Mark, there are going to be significant challenges there. More and more and more and more online, uh, for example. But if you're in a particular specialized area, then you've built, a, 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 you, you kind of build a kind of a protection around you uh, that actually gives you some sort of leverage or some sort of space. So there are some of the key factors I think you need to, need to ask yourself, but also ask yourself, where is the world and where's the industry going? And is this the industry you're going to be in? Is there a long-term future in the industry? Um, going back into a little bit more macro uh, uh, stuff, um, a couple of things I believe that's going to come out of this. One is there's going to be a much less reliance on China than what there has been. Countries are going to try and produce more of their key products and services and facilities within their own boundaries, within their own geographical boundaries. There's going to be more of that. That was already happening to a degree. Uh, so it was uh, the US, the Yanks were pulling some of their manufacturing back from China. And there was, there was some concern about that. So that's going to happen significantly more. Um, I would have a concern for the uh, EU, European Union, because what a number of countries have done unilaterally, they've set up boundaries themselves within Europe. That's an issue. There's a big war on now. I was reading the Financial Times this morning, and uh, there's a big issue now. The ECB, European Central Bank, are, want to create a Eurozone uh, bad bank to clean up the toxic loans from the bank's balance sheet all over Europe. Obviously, the Greeks and those want that because they're, they have significant uh, amounts of toxic loans in their banks. Ireland is in a different position. In 2016, we had 16% of all of the loans in our banks were what they call toxic loans. Now it's only 3.2%. So 
So it's, our banks are in a very, very strong position, but there's a lot of disharmony in Europe in relation to the way forward. Uh, and then obviously nobody's talking about Brexit now. That was the center of focus up to maybe two months ago. How is that going to play out? So there's a lot of geopolitical factors that will influence trade, that will influence economies, that will influence uh, exchange rates. The price of oil was never lower. It's down, I think, 20% on what it was a month ago. Uh, that's also a significant factor. And it's important for us to orientate around those factors that how or if are these going to affect my business or our business. So there's the macro and also there's the, the sense of the micro. Yeah, that's great, Porik. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and next, uh, isn't so much a question, but this is, again, a lovely example of the kind of organic peer-to-peer -peer, um, learning that's been happening over this webinar. So Yvonne has been in touch. Um, so Yvonne is saying, particularly to Aoife, who had the furniture business earlier, but to everybody, I suppose, who, who's listening, um, minding your employees and your finance and cash flow is the essential first step. Reimagining how you can do business in the future is next. Um, and, and Yvonne is actually offering her services to work with small companies for free to help them relook at their customers, their service and products to help them refocus. And she thought, Aoife, your furniture company was a perfect example of a company who can reposition um, their business now, you know, in terms of viewing new opportunities. Um, so Yvonne has 25 years experience helping businesses um, and she, she wants to give back. So um, I think anyone who is interested in that or Aoife um, in particular, if you just want to email me directly, we can set that up offline as well. So that's uh, lovely to hear that, um, that engagement and community spirit among our participants as well. Great, great to hear that, yeah. Good. Okay, so that's all of the questions. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm wrong. Um, I have one just coming in here now, bear with me. Sorry, so Alva, uh, I've been watching all sessions with interest and learned so much. Thank you, it's great to hear Alva. We're trying to manage practicalities as best we can. So, it's so she's so glad to hear the conversation today and the insights from Padraig and Mark. That's I think my sense too. It, it's addressing the importance of having a personal coping strategy, which is something we don't always acknowledge. And uncertainty, which all of us are feeling at this moment, it can be debilitating if you aren't in a good headspace. So these personal contributions today um, have been very reassuring and uplifting. Um, so I think that's, a, that's lovely to hear. Um, and certainly I think was the intention behind, uh, as well as talking about the practicalities, sure. but also to, to talk about the, the, the individual managing that change. Yeah, I think that's great. It's really good. good. And I, I think one of the things that will help people with that headspace is the fact that, you know, we're, we are seeing a flattening. We are seeing maybe, you know, restrictions lifted. It may be that the business model, if I can use that phrase, or the old way of working might not work 100% uh, in, when the business is reopened, let's say. So there's a lot of businesses out there that maybe with very, very small adjustments, I would just suggest, uh, you know, such as doing a little bit more online, redesigning a website or changing how they deliver or whatever it is that uh, might actually help. Uh, and I think I had a few slides on that actually that might help to, to Great, form yeah. a bit of a discussion if you want me to just run through them for five minutes or so. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Uh, just about, and just to, to kind of maybe remind you uh, and maybe put a bit of context on that forward thinking, I suppose. Um, if I can just throw these up here, hopefully you can see those. Um, I think this is to kind of take the back that, you know, after we get through the emergency, we begin to think a little bit about what Podrick was talking about there earlier. You know, if you're going off to fly a plane to somewhere, you have to know where you're heading to. Uh, and although we don't have an exact timing for the exit strategy, we do know that it's going to be kind of sooner rather than, than later, you know. Uh, and I would suggest that one of the things that people need to do in business, and this might help to clear your head and kind of say, look, there's something to live for. Um, have a look at a couple of websites one I would recommend is the European Commission. Um, they have the roadmap for lifting coronavirus containment measures. There's a nice little short report in here that basically says, uh, we don't know when things are going to happen, but this is likely to be the order that they happen in. So it gives you at least, if not a, an exact date, at least the ranking of what's going to happen first 
what's going to happen second. And a lot of this has kind of been reported in the newspapers anyway, so you don't, but I, I just kind of recommend going to the original website kind of to look at what's going to happen here. And this gives you some kind of idea of, you know, what is the order the things are going to happen in and how do I then, as a, or how does my business respond to that, you know? So, you know, which bit of my business can I fit in with uh, the, the reopening, if you like, of, 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 of society? Um, you know, when are the borders going to come down? When are the tourists going to, to occur? Which, which order is it going to happen in, first of all, you know? Uh, and if, if my only business is, if you look down at the bottom of this page, you notice item number four, mass gatherings. If I was running a football stadium, I would be very, very worried because mass gatherings is something that's going to be several years down the road or at least several months down the road. Um, but there may be other things that I can use that resource for in the interim. So, for example, if I own a very, very large building that is designed for mass gatherings, um, could I use that to allow other groups who effectively reopen their businesses or their activities before me um, to, to, to use those facilities. So I'm thinking, for example, a lot of talk at the moment about the Leaving Cert secondary schools, bringing people back, you know. If I have a big, you know, 10,000 square foot hall with nothing in it other than space, um, maybe I could offer that um, to a school. Um, maybe I could offer it to a university. You know, maybe there are spacing uh, things that I can provide. The resource I can provide effectively is space. Uh, and there aren't that many large indoor spaces. So normally I would like to pack my venue with a band up on the stage and loads of people buying drink and food, but I'm not going to be able to do that in the current landscape. But as it reopens, maybe I sort of change what I'm doing and I, I reopen part of my business uh, linked to uh, effectively a, a, a short-term business model that, that keeps me going. And I think if you look at, for example, uh, New Zealand as an example of this, they're that little bit ahead of us. They're two or three weeks ahead of where we are, I would say, maybe a little bit more. And they've begun to say, this is how we believe it's going to happen. Obviously, as we relax the measures, if things go wrong, if we get a second surge of virus, things are going to have to go back to the way they are. But within that, we know what the guidance is. Here are the different levels, and here's how it's likely to happen. So we can use this without kind of having a time constraint to give us an idea of where we're going to go. So, you know, home delivery is a classic example of that. If I cannot uh, get people to come to me in my store or uh, to come to where I manufacture, I have to go to them. You know, so whether it's fuel, food, whatever, we've seen lots of examples of businesses doing home delivery. Um, one that's local to me here, a few miles away from where I am, unfortunately, just outside the two kilometers, so I can't go to visit them in any case, but a small business that runs a cafe and restaurant, and they're delivering all day breakfast, they're delivering pizzas, etc. So um, they're doing lots and lots of good stuff, if you like. So um, just think about it. Um, another business that was local to me up to very, very recently. Uh, there was a store in Churchtown in South Dublin called Churchtown Stores. A lot of people would know this. It was a bit of a landmark. A lot of people know, knew it as the Brothers. And people heard a couple of years ago that it was closing down. And everyone was kind of, oh, why? You know, was it the big, you know, Woodies and whoever competing? Were, no, no, we've just reached retirement age. The four brothers are we're retiring, we're selling the business, we're going out of business. That was a, a, effectively a hardware store. Uh, it was bought over, the building was bought over, and it's now a pub. They've kept the signage, they've kept the original signage, okay? Now, if I was the pub owner here, and I don't know them, I'm just, I'm just doing this as an example off the top of my head, I might be sort of saying, maybe when I return to business, my model is going to be a little bit more like one of those um, pubs maybe that you used to find in places like Dingle and Connemara, et cetera, where you could go in and you could buy a pint, you could buy a pot of paint to help our decorator friend that we were talking about earlier, you could buy screws, you could buy hammers. You know, um, they're all retail businesses of a sort. Um, but you can be damn sure that you're going to be able to sell hardware a lot quicker than you are trying to Guinness uh, in the reopening. So the strategy just needs to be maybe an adaption, a small innovation, or in fact, I'd just call it an improvement on the, the business that you already have. So, you know, try and think about how could I extend my exit strategy into a, an emergency strategy? And again, gather data on how the reopening is planned for in other countries and in this country, but also look then to see what examples there are of businesses reopening 
uh, and then try and guess. And then in a way, for, 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 for many businesses, it doesn't matter what the date is. Uh, but others, you might have to kind of say, how long can I stay liquid until? Um, and do I need extra funding to keep me going until, until I start to reopen? Do I need protection, such as examination? But they're not really the important things. The important things are, uh, what do I do to reopen part of my business? So try and think about the exit strategy, maybe being not returning to normal, but to return to what those people keep calling the new normal. There's a new normalcy coming along. Um, and it's not like we um, have control of it, but we do have information. We do have data about it. And, you know, uh, one of the famous writers in the, in the area of um, decision making, Daniel Kahneman, I don't know if any have ever read his book, um, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And one of the things he talks about is that very often business people, when they're in a crisis like this, they use their gut instinct. They go with their gut and they kind of say, this is what feels right. And actually says when they do that, they, they're usually wrong about 75% of the time. Going with gut instinct only works about 25% of the time. Actually, the people who make the good decisions are the ones who gather the data, limited data that is available, whether it's quantitative or qualitative. And what I mean by gathering data is go online and read the newspapers, read the journal, find out what's happening in other countries, not just in Ireland. Try and identify what the patterns and the trends are and what opportunities there might be for your business. Yeah. So that kind of exit strategy, if I can call it that, um, is the next step for many, many businesses. For those who can't, who haven't been able to continue during the last few weeks, there's probably, for the majority of businesses, there's going to be an opportunity over the next few weeks or few months to reopen. But it might not be reopening to the same business that we had in the past. It's probably going to be not a massively disruptive new innovation. It's going to be adding something on or being able to do something in a slightly different way. Home delivery, online something like that, adding that on to our existing business. So if I'm a high street retailer now and I have no online presence, I would be looking very, very strongly to having an online and a home delivery service. But every business has some other option that it can look at in the area of, well, every part of business, pricing, distribution, etc. And I think it could be an opportunity, as Podrick was mentioning earlier on, about trying to get something where you can control the pricing. Um, your position in the supply chain or the value chain should be such that you get a little bit more control over the pricing if that's possible as part of your exit strategy use this as a as a crisis opportunity you know um, i've been forced into this i for the first time in years of running my business i have an opportunity to think and if i was thinking like an external consultant or somebody independent of the business i'd probably come along and sort of say do you know what you should do you should go online or do you know what you should do you should take more control of your input costs or do you know what you should do is you could you know why not produce your own uh, raw materials instead of buying them in or something like that all of those things should be up for grabs i think in in the next uh you know think can i do things a little bit differently in the short term and then when you look forward into the longer term maybe think about changing your your overall business model to an even greater extent yeah so I don't, I don't know, Podrick, if, if you have any thoughts on that kind of idea about kind of restarting the business, but maybe not, not restarting it as business as usual, but being careful to use this as an opportunity. You know, you would probably find this within an examination. It gives you that breathing space to, you know, kind of look around and kind of say, well, what exactly do I have? What resources, what assets? Can I reconfigure them in some different way? And it doesn't mean, you know, it's not like you're in an airline business, you're not saying, I'm getting rid of the planes, we're going to do buses. You know, it's not that dramatic disruptive change, but it is maybe kind of saying, well, look, my load factors are this on, on these routes. What if I go different routes? Maybe I have different load factors. Or, you know, why am I selling and competing with the low cost when I could, you know, uh, go up at the high end or whatever it is, you know, it's going to be different for every business. But I think it, an opportunity to reconfigure your business, reconfigure the business model. And I hate using words like reconfigure and business model because it sounds very, you know, up there kind of, but it's, in reality, it's often just thinking about something slightly different that enables my business to, to survive and then prosper. So I don't know, maybe, uh, do you want to add some, some thoughts on that? Uh, I have little to add to it, Mark, because that's, you've hit the nail on the head in, in many, many respects on it. Um, I suppose just to share with you, uh, people often ask, 
where do you get a business idea from? And this is what I've seen. What you do is you'd say, what are the problems people are going to have when we get out of this? What problems need to be solved? And can you solve those problems with a business model to reinvent your business model to solve it? Let me give you two examples. Uh, I'll give you three. One is uh, there's a guy, a guy called Freddie Carlson. You may or may not have heard of Freddie. Freddie is a great guy He's from uh, Sweden. He was going out together from Wexford over there. She moved back to Ireland. She worked in Intel. He was lovesick and he came back to Ireland after her. He sold all his furniture and his second-hand car online in Sweden. There was no online facility in Ireland, so he went to buy and sell and he started looking to see where he could buy second-hand furniture and so on on the magazine. He says, look, that's crazy. Let me set up a website here in Ireland that's a little bit similar but different to the one in Sweden. And you know what his company is called? Dundeal.ie. He solved a problem. So we did. Another lady, Gráinne Kelly. Gráinne's from Derry, Northern Ireland. Gráinne worked in a, uh, she was a manager in a travel office and travel agency in Derry. And the biggest problem people had when they were coming after holidays or complaining was the car seat for their kids. Either it wasn't with the car they hired out, they couldn't find one, or it was dirty or was the wrong size. You know what she did? She actually created a, uh, an inflatable car seat for kids called Bubble Bump. They're selling over 2 million a year now at the moment, mainly in America. Now, Gronya did not come from an entrepreneurial business background, but she saw a problem. Uh, a third one, a number of years ago, do you remember guys when we ran out of road salt in Ireland? Jeez, we couldn't go any place. I actually went on the internet, I contacted business people I know. I ended up buying the road salt from a guy I never met in Miami. It came out of Egypt and it came out of Northern Italy and we sold it to the NRA. It was a problem, but hadn't been solved. So I'm asking you, in your industry, what problems do you think need to be solved, will need to be solved up there? As DJ Carey said once, he says, I actually go, and it came, somebody else said it in, in hockey in, in, in America or Canada years ago. I go to where the ball is going to land. I'm not going to go to pick up the ball after it has hit the ground. Because he knows from whoever is hitting the ball, is wing back or corner back, he has a good idea where that person is going to hit the ball. So he's a yard in front of the person that's marking him. So be a yard in front of whoever is marking you. Look to where the ball is going to go. And uh, that's all I can say, Mark, in, in support of what you're saying. Great, that's very good. Thanks, Walter, for that. I think it's really useful to think about that. And I liked your, you know, earlier on you were talking about strategy, about you know what would the world look like with me, without me type of analogy. Um, I, you know, I mentioned Richard Rummel uh, a, a while ago, and he's one. Of, I, I see him as a great strategist, you know, uh, but he's one of these. He's, he has an academic background, but he's somebody who sort of says, you know, if you think about strategy, people start thinking about strategy. They start thinking about vision and i don't mean it in the sense that you you mentioned it earlier i think it's very important to have a a mental picture of where you're going but very often that gets translated into mission statements mm -hmm. and written down corporate documents and what the ceo says is more important than what everyone else says in the organization uh, and long-term budgets and all that kind of stuff and you know uh Rummelt is kind of one of these guys that kind of says up oh, all it is is something happens in the environment either internal or external environment. There's a change. Something has driven that change. There's a force that drives that change. And all the strategy is, is something that you verbalize or write down on a piece of paper that is a cohesive response to that change. Yeah. So the old demand or whatever the demand was before uh, no longer exists. There's a slightly different demand now. And your business then has to respond to that which doesn't usually mean, you know, everyone kind of gives the plaudits to these people who kind of bring in the, the big disruptive model, you know, the Ubers of the world and all that kind of thing. The reality is that innovation and change management is made up of lots of small and medium sized companies making small and medium sized yeah. improvements, I would call them rather than innovations to their business. And it's exactly that kind of, you need salt, where in the world can we get salt? 
you know, um, let's get it in here and let's get it doing the job kind of thing. Instead of kind of thinking about it maybe at a, you know, oh, we need to do a report on this kind of thing, you know. Exactly. Um, it's, it's kind of just get on with it in some respects. It's respond quickly and immediately if you can. And when you have a little bit more time to think about it, then think about what are the long-term forces and drivers that are going to affect my business? And how can I begin to build uh, competencies and capabilities to meet those in, in, in the future? So as things change in the long-term, I position myself a bit like you're saying, uh, you know, you need to be the yard ahead or the meter ahead. Uh, you need to know where that is. You might not know the exact spot it is, mm-hmm. um, but you want to know the area, you want to know the range, you want to know the rough area that you want to be, and you want to be there before the other guy gets there. And um, so you use your whatever time time you have to kind of do that long term planning, and in the short term, you just respond to to what people are are, are asking you for effectively. Yeah, good, good. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I don't know, Elish, if any um any more questions. I yeah. Know, I, I have the, the text boxes <laughs> driving away at the side here. No, talking, absolutely. Can't, can't read and talk. I'm not. I'm not skilled. My wife no. tells me I'm not. I'm not multi skilled. You don't need to uh, <laughs> to, to multitask. I think uh, the two of you are doing a, a powerhouse of work there. So I look after the Q and A. Don't worry. Okay. Um, there was one question just going back to the retail thing, and I know this is something that a lot of our participants um are, are thinking about. So we've quite a number of of retailers, um, and other related businesses is um, taking part but Aoife I suppose goes back to um, what we were talking about retail and, and that changed landscape post coronavirus and I think Mark you, you both alluded to the fact that it was probably a sector under change anyway and mm-hmm. um, so looking at the likes of Debenhams and, and so on that aren't going to be reopening in mm-hmm. Ireland now do you think at a macro level that maybe some of this is Brexit planning coming into play now accelerated by the coronavirus um you know and it's just really that this um what's happening now has just accelerated um what was going to be changing anyway yeah yeah i think so and i think i think probably the fact that we have in this country done some brexit planning has, is great for us because we know you know big change coming up it's not the change we expected actually <laughs> they've happened in a slightly different order but at least it means that we were thinking about different scenarios and alternative futures as I can call them that but I think if you're in a business like retail which is changing a lot and um, some of the things that we sometimes do with our students here in the college when we're, we're trying to do things that are innovative is really to ask the very very awkward questions like um, what would retail look like if you didn't actually have a physical store and that sounds like a little bit silly because most people immediately say oh we'll just do it online you know say yeah but if, if you didn't have online imagine like this is 40 or 50 years ago but your store was gone, it had been burnt down to the ground in a fire overnight, how would you continue that retail business? It's a very provocative question, but I think you need to think that creative way if you're in a business like retail, which is changing uh, and which, which may need those kind of alternative approaches. I mean, I keep banging on about home delivery and online, but they're only two things and everyone knows about them. So they don't give you any kind of advantage over your competitors. It's what's the other thing that you're, that nobody else is thinking of doing that we try to do. So I often kind of think about what if there was nothing there, there's no physical store. What if you were 10 times larger or a hundred times larger than you are? You know, this is all in your imagination. You don't have to do it for real. You just have to say, imagine my business has had a hundred times more money than it has, it has in the bank now. What would I do with it apart from retire maybe and go off and spend the rest of the day on, my be- on the beach somewhere? Uh, what would happen if it was 10 times smaller? How would I be managing it? How, what would I be doing differently? So how would I be micro? Uh, what would my micro strategy be? Um, what would happen if I wasn't the retailer, but I was the customer? What does the customer want from retail? And going the other way in the value chain as well then. Maybe I stop being a retailer, but I become the person who produces whatever it is I sell in my store. What would that look like? Now, the advantage of doing all of that kind of is that it gives you other people's perspectives on your business that you might not have. Because you're normally, you know, you're blinkers, you're, you're down like this and you're kind of going, yeah, operations, get this done, get the money, get the, you know, pay the bills, you're running it day to day. And taking a bit of time out to think about how do other people see my business, 360 degree look at the business. Stop being yourself in a way for a moment and think about how other people look at it and see if you can come up with those alternative ways. And they are likely to be small improvements again. It's not as dramatic as get rid of the store, but it's maybe maybe I could operate out of less square footage, for example, but still provide the same service. 
so thinking that type of way might might help. So I don't know, uh, Padraig, maybe, I don't know, do you want to come in on that as well? Um, yeah, and, and I'd also maybe, if it's okay to get back, so I didn't answer a question that was asked earlier about rural Ireland and so on. So if I can focus a little bit on that. Um, first of all, I don't think there was hardly ever a better time to get involved in an SME than there is now. The best time to get involved in it, starting up your own business or driving your own business is when there's significant disruption, when there's uncertainty. That's the best time to, to, to get involved. And not to, not to drown in the fear, but actually to swim in the fear. Now, I'm saying that because there's a couple of things we spoke about earlier, but one of them is, I actually believe we're going to have a significantly inc increase in import substitution in Europe and in Ireland. In other words, we'll be doing a lot more products and services ourselves that we imported up to now. So if you look in your industry and you'd say, what, what are we taking in that possibly I could do? Or I could add as a bolt on to what I am doing. And actually in time, that could be your main business. That could be another leg under the stool that initially is just a thought and becomes a business. The other thing is in relation to, uh, a person asked a question earlier, Eilish, about rural Ireland. And I'm saying that in the context of SMEs. Um, there's a couple of things here. Uh, one is that... Hmm? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we lost you for a second, but you're back there now, Podrick. You did, no, there was, there was somebody trying to call me. Um, no, um, in relation to rural Ireland and SMEs, I believe we have a great opportunity in rural Ireland in relation to SMEs. More and more people want to be living in rural Ireland if they can, is one. Uh, secondly, there are people from rural Ireland who are working in places like Dublin, Cork, Galway and, and Limerick to a degree that would prefer move back there. So I think we're going to get a certain amount of migration and rebalancing of, of, of population in relation to rural Ireland. I believe the hubs, you've got Ludgate and Cork, uh, you've got a one in Dundalk, a name escapes me, you've got the Porter, Porter, Porter Shed in Galway, where you've got these innovation hubs. They're going to continue. But in actual fact, I believe they're going to grow into places like there's one in Sligo already, but you're going to have Mullingar, you're going to have other places around the country where you've got these innovation hubs. They're going to interact together, but they're going to become more specialized. Like, for example, in Galway, the med tech is a big, big industry in Galway. Like, I have a stent in. One in every four stents that's implanted in people in the world is made in Galway, believe it or not. And there are a whole lot of other businesses that feed off that in relation to small businesses. The other thing that's going to happen, I'm convinced, that if people are working remotely, you know what the tax allowance is at the moment if you're working from home? Extra tax allowance for your electricity and so on. It's about €3.20 Euros 20 cents a day. That's the tax allowance. That needs to, and, and I've made submissions to government on this, that needs to increase to something like €20 or so Euros a day, so it does, to help cover whatever extra cost there is of you doing your work from home. Um, so we're going, to get, we're going to get significantly more of that. I actually believe also that government will create uh, opportunities like enhanced EIIS uh, system, which is uh, whereby investors invest money in relation to startup businesses. Now the focus is on particular industries. Like, for example, nursing homes can get it if they're doing an extension or whatever they're doing to their nursing home and other specific industries. It's not geographically focused. I believe government are going to go and make that geographically focused. So any, any area of the country that has lower, or sorry, a higher than average unemployment, higher than the national average unemployment, that there will be a focus looking for private investment to invest in businesses in those areas, to reignite and rekindle those areas. So from a national perspective, also we've been looking for a minister focused on SMEs solely. SMEs, there are 250,000 of them in Ireland. They employ almost 1.2 million, million people. And we don't have a minister that's focused purely on SMEs, a government minister or a department. I believe we're going to get more and more of that. So it's more about encouraging ourselves and our people to be enablers in growing and developing their own business. And I believe incentives are going to be put in place for that. In rural Ireland, but also in the city areas, but there are different needs for SMEs in city areas compared to rural Ireland. 
Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Um, actually, we've a little bit of um, since you got that call, Podrick, a little bit of uh, echo coming through. I think so. Um, oh no, it's gone. Oh. That's great. No, that's okay. perfect. Sorry. Um, yeah, so we actually had a, a follow on question about those, about those hubs um, around, um, which I think you've largely answered um, the question. Um, but I suppose the question here from an anonymous poster was, do you think there'll be adequate demand to make these hubs a viable business concept in rural Ireland? Um, or, or do you think they'll be more state-led will they be initiatives that are, are put in no. place yeah I, I think what's going to happen like in Germany in, in early January or so I went out to Frankfurt and one of the largest hubs business innovation hubs in Germany is in this place in Frankfurt there's over 300 businesses there and what happens there the whole purpose of this incubation is that if somebody with a business idea, you give them a, a hot desk or a desk and a computer and access to various libraries and databases and so on. And actually, they actually start developing their, their business. They get mentoring as well and support, which is really important. And then they can bounce off other people who are starting their own business. So you've got this collaborative, active learning going on at the same time. Now, what you have, in a much more structured way in Germany that we don't have yet in Ireland. You've got the pillar banks are to some degree involved uh, in Ireland, but it's kind of pretty sporadic. So you've got that, but we need to have, we, and, and the third level institutions are a little bit diving in and out of that. We need to have a coordinated structured approach because third level institutions are critical in this, in relation to research and support and creating the environment in which actually these businesses can grow and develop. So it's a combination of third level institutions, the uh, corroboration between the entrepreneurs in this environment, and also the backing of, of the banks and financial institutions and the environment then supported by government. And what happens then is when somebody builds their business out of this embryonic situation, they actually grow and actually physically move out of there because they need bigger space and they actually physically move out of there and they've got their own space. So now this little, this, little, this little butterfly has grown up and it has moved on. That's the whole idea of it. And I believe that's going to happen in Ireland. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I, th I think I'd add to that just about that not all hubs need to be innovative as well. You know, innovation mm. hubs are great, but even just teleworking, sharing offices, shared facilities, things like that, also kind of gain a certain amount of people bumping into each other in the corridor and small businesses. I mean, I know of a local shopping center that I have here, I'd call it kind of call it a community retail center. For many years existed as one, one floor, had a bike shop, a hairdressers, all that type of thing. There's now a floor above that. And most of the people working on that floor above are effectively in a shared hub. They're, they're sharing IT resources, good broadband, all that type of thing. They're running small businesses, but they're bouncing off each other. They're meeting each other, going in and out of the car park and all that type of thing and saying, what do you do? What do I do? What do you know, could we do business together? So it doesn't even have to be, you know, that we're deliberately setting it up with massive R&D grants and help from Enterprise Ireland and stuff. Sometimes it just, those little hubs, you know, once they're set up and the private sector can, can build them very often without any input. Um, once you get the right kind of mix of tenants in there, they tend to have a, a buzz of their own and, and they really take off. It helps if you have a few creative minds in there as well, you know, um, mm -hmm. but they all, I mean, I've always seen in, in every case where people have got together like that, uh, there's always some kind of one plus one equals three kind of situation uh, arises out of it, you know. Yeah, and can I just come back on that? That's a, yeah, it's, it's not all about hubs. Um, I, I, I'm just looking at a question here that Jimmy has raised uh, in relation to getting involved with another company, not on a necessarily a permanent basis, but just kind of kickstart the business and bring it forward. And in relation to tour company and forming a relationship with, let's call it parallel businesses like a coffee shop, absolutely go for that. See where there is synergy. You do not have to reinvent the wheel so you don't, but say, okay, if there's this add-on, there's a win-win-win here, and we can give a much more collaborative, um, uh, how I put it, package to the customer, and actually then give us that value added, give us that edge. One of the things we did long ago in in Iran was, uh, if it's a delay in a flight, that was the biggest reason why people would complain. So actually, I went to the Irish Independent and I said, guys, will you give me will you give me copies of the Independent free of charge? 
He says, why would we do that? I said, look, at I have so many hundreds of thousands of passengers. I'll give them a free copy on the airplane and you're marketing your, your, your independent newspaper. So, oh, we need to get something for it because we're, we're, we're getting an ABC or the Bureau of Circulation. We need to have our numbers up. I said, okay, I'll give you 10 cents, but you give me 10 cents of advertising back. So we did that. So then what happened when people were getting a free copy of a newspaper of the independent on board the airplane, they're absolutely thrilled. They said, wow, what a service, you know? So there are ways of actually going and doing it. And Jimmy, go for it. And anybody, everybody who's listening here, look at, look at who you can collaborate with, who is not in a competitive space with you, but is in a collaborative complementary space with you. And that's back to Mark's point. It's totally outside. You don't have to be in a, in a designated physical hub to do it. So you don't. But mm -hmm. challenge yourself in looking outside the box a little bit on that. And it's a great point, Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy is one of our, our great contributors since the very start. So uh, yeah, excellent questions every every time. Um, so we have another question, Podrick, um, regarding something you mentioned at the very beginning, the importance of your people in the organization and that your people grow your business. Um, so this contributor, and who's anonymous, um, is just starting out in the services business. They, she's worked or he's worked in large corporates and would have a lot of people and departments to draw on, but finding it really difficult to do it by themselves. Um, they're caught in a catch-22 as they need resources to offer services, but can't, as somebody starting out, um, they can't afford to recruit. So how do you get over this initial phase of getting people on board to be able to grow the business? Um, because as you said, people grow your business. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's the single biggest challenge any startup has, quite frankly. And I had the same thing back in the day in the airline because people would say, who's this Connemara crazy man trying to build an airline and he's no money and he's no experience? What's he at? And they were right. Banks wouldn't give me any money. And if I were them, I wouldn't give me any money. But in any event, that was it. So you, kind of, you can imagine me asking an employee from Ryanair or Lingus come working for me. They'd be crazy. I wouldn't work for myself. So the only people I could get, quite frankly, were people who left other businesses or were disengaged with where they were or were in different industries. And we got them together. And what I decided to do was that these are the resources we have. These are the resources we can afford. Got to be pragmatic. Now, what's the best we can do with those resources that we have? And let's be open and honest and fair with them. And so you use the resources you have. What you need to do then is when you get to a certain level, you are investing in those resources. And some of those people have the interest and the ability to keep driving on. And unfortunately, sometimes some people don't. That's a fact of life. That is business. Toughest decision you got to make in business is say to somebody, I got to take you off the pitch. I got to take your jersey away and give it to somebody else. It's the toughest decisions I've ever made. That was much tougher than putting the company into examinership. So it was. Because they did their best while they were on the pitch with you. And now they're in a different position. But just back to it, you gotta, you got to work with what you have. But what you have is going to change on time. The individuals are going to change. The requirements of the company are going to change. Some of the people, a lot of the people, will be able to change as the company grows. Because people are growing like that and the company is growing like that. And there is a, there is a sense of which is growing faster, which is growing slower. And as a leader, you need to try and create, that, create and keep that balance. And your purpose is the common good, the overall good. I hope that's of some help. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Podrick. Um, and and Bassi, apologies if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, Bassi. Um, he's coming back to the, the comments on the innovation hubs. Uh, and I think going back to what you were saying as well, Mark, on the co-working spaces, um, I suppose, um, do we not already achieve a measure of this with the growth of co-working spaces with the accelerator programs for SMEs and startups and um, programs like New Frontiers um, 
and, and he says that although currently the government do not support co-working spaces, but they can be in the innovation hubs that you mentioned. So I suppose it is important that we differentiate between those two, is it? I think it is, but I think also in the future, I think you will see support for co-working centres, possibly from government, etc., because I can see that people will realise that there's potential employment creation, etc., in that and keeping people in rural economies rather than having everyone to commute into towns and cities all the time. You know, there's an opportunity there which can't necessarily be just measured in in pure financial terms if we can keep, you know, um, people living in rural vi villages and working close to home and having shorter commutes and things like that. Um, that's all beneficial and I, th I, th I think if one other thing, you know, I, 20 years ago, I did, when I was doing my MBA, I did my, uh, my research project was actually about on, on e-working at the time, which was very much in its infancy. Uh, and even then, you know, the, the solutions were the technical problems, all that kind of stuff was easy. Mm -hmm. The big drawback was people's attitude. Sure, they'd be dozen. They'd be, you know, they won't work as hard. They'd be unproductive. All those kinds of negative things that you would have heard. Um, this, um, crisis, if you want to call it, has forced people to work from home, has forced people to work in small groups, and suddenly people realise, while it's not perfect, it actually works quite well, and given the right supports and the right technical infrastructure, and maybe a little bit of money, and, you know, Padraig mentioned about the, is it 320 a day, I think, is the allowance that you get from revenue for, for, um, from, for home working, that's supposed to cover your broadband electricity and stuff. That's not really adequate if we want to go into home working or if we want to go into kind of having hubs. So we have to have, I think, as, as a country, we probably have to have a serious look at it. There are other countries that are way ahead of us on this. Um, and they're not just investing in innovation hubs, they're investing in all sorts of different hubs, service hubs, um, administrative hubs, all that type of thing. Um, if you can encourage and keep small businesses, particularly in rural economies, I think uh, it's really, really beneficial overall um, because it reduces your costs elsewhere as a society. Yeah, that's great, Mark. And I mean, personally, I commute um, and pre all of this, I had started, as you know, Mark, on a phase basis, doing a little bit more work from home. Um, but you do miss the social side of it. So that idea of the co-working space and, and having somewhere to go to that isn't an hour and a half in the car, um, but somewhere to physically leave the house and interact with others um, is, is a really valuable thing as well. So yeah, I think you're right. It's definitely something that's going to grow and grow. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in and we're, we're, we're nearing the end of our time. So thank you guys. We've, we've had a great engagement from everybody. Um, but Oliver just is wondering, Padraig, um, out of interest, I suppose, and curiosity, how do you see the airline business getting back into, uh, getting back going after all of this? How okay. And there. Um, the larger airlines are going to be fine. Uh, not going to be a problem. The Aer Lingus is part of the AIG, Ryanair, all of those are going to be fine because they've got, pardon, pardon the pun, Oliver, but they've got plenty of runway. In other words, they've plenty of cash to, uh, to keep them going. In actual fact, I believe they're going to be even stronger because they're going to, this uh, surreal situation is going to push out or close down or make a lot, lot weaker the smaller regional airlines. So they're going to be a lot, lot more difficult. The second issue, though, is you're going to have an unease uh, from a public perspective of taking flights and flying away on holidays and flying to different places. People will be pretty slow to go back. Uh, I hear that EasyJet are actually taking out or getting a situation where people will not be sitting in the middle aisle. So there'll be a bit of social distancing between, between people on both the airplane. That kind, of, that kind of strategy, those kind of strategies would be needed in order to start giving people confidence to actually start, start flying again. Airports will need to start doing some stuff like the infrared uh, uh, kind of checking in relation to heat and temperature and all of that on people. So things, things will change. The larger airlines will be fine. Um, the smaller airlines are going to seriously, seriously struggle. Um, Stobart Air are, are, as we know, in, in pretty serious difficulty. Uh, it looks like the Stobart Group are going to take over uh, Stobart Air. It's not going to go into receivership as was thought. Um, CityJet are in a difficult, different position. They're losing significant money at the moment. I, I don't know what's going to happen there. They may, 
they may be merged in into some form of a larger structure. But the smaller airlines are, we're going to have less and less and less smaller airlines. If I can step back then, Ailish, and say overall, I actually think the larger companies, um, the Googles, the, 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 the Amazons of this world, are going to continue to get bigger. And it's going to be really, really difficult. The, those in the middle are going to be squeezed. It's going to be a lot, lot more difficult for those. So you're going to have a smaller number of huge companies. You're going to have a larger number of SMEs. And you're going to have very, very few in the middle, I think, because they're going to have difficulty in keeping going on that. Uh, just back to an earlier point, if I may, uh, briefly, in relation to new frontiers on that. My, been, I'm like, in this conversation, as you know, I'm, been very, very open and, and very blunt and very honest. Um, in my four years in the Shannon, everybody I saw there and the ministers and so on and so forth, they all meant well. They're really, they're there for the right reasons, the people I met and what I sense from them. But you've got people who are in positions who really don't have the experience of the portfolios that they're in charge of. They just, they just don't do it. They haven't worn the jersey. They don't really, really, really get it. Another thing I'd say is that the organizations, state organizations who are there to support SMEs, they're not coordinated. They're not singing up the same hymn sheet. I've been speaking to a number of CEOs of the LEOs, local enterprise organizations. They're in competition with each other. So they are. They're overlapping all over the place. You've got something like in the West of Ireland, something like 34 different state organizations who are helping to support SMEs all over the place. An awful lot of um, trust and financial trust is given to Enterprise Ireland. And I think they're absolutely brilliant. They're one of the best organizations in the world and we're blessed to have them. I think they're really good. But Enterprise Ireland, if you look at their brief, is looking, their purpose is to support Irish companies that are going to export. Irish companies that are going to export are a small percentage of all of the total SMEs that are out there. They're really important, absolutely. But I believe that we're not really supporting the SMEs, the other SMEs out there, the other 80, 85% of SMEs out there. And even the support that we're giving them, it's all over the place, they don't know where to go. Single biggest question is me say, look at, there's no support available, or if there is, where do I go? Who do I talk to? So there's, there's no joined up thinking or communication there, uh, unfortunately. And if we get that right, we certainly can be one of the best little countries in the world for SMEs. Yeah, I think I'd agree. I, I think the, the local enterprise offices have upped their game as well in recent years, but there is still a bit of a gap there between, you know, knowing where to go and having multiple agencies. And if you're a small business, quite frankly, you don't have time to be going around looking at loads of different websites and things like that. Yeah. So I think some things have been simplified, you know. So, you know, I would say to a lot of people, for example, at the moment, there's a the small little grant going through the LEOs to, to bring your business online. And most of the local enterprise offices give that out fairly mm. easily, I would yeah. say. So it doesn't really, you know, you don't have to, you have to spend money yourself, yes, to match it a little bit. Um, but, you know, if you sort of said, well, actually, I want to spend all my money on advertising on Facebook, they, they usually kind of allow that to work within the system. So they're, they're good at doing that type of thing. And I think having little hubs of businesses working together in the future might also help that a little bit where businesses help each other as well as, as government helps businesses, if you know, I could, I could put it that way. Because I would agree, I think Enterprise Ireland do a, a fantastic job, as does IDA Ireland in bringing investment in. Um, but we've always kind of ignored, and I know I understand that there are EU restrictions on how much funding and other things you can you can give to smaller businesses. Um, we're probably still not doing enough to support them, though, uh, uh, even from an innovation point of view, or from a change management point of view. And, you know, the, the, they will need that. That, that help. Uh, we'll all need that help over the next year um, to, to get our businesses going again. 
Hey, brilliant. That's great. Um, and then our final question um, is from John and he's asking, how do we see the industry of coaching or training changing over the next few months? Can online replace face to face? Um, well, myself and Mark have a lot of experience of that in recent weeks. Um, I suppose the, the book is coming out in two weeks time. Yeah. <laughs> um, the manual is slowly being written here. Um, I suppose in, in terms of the education piece, um, I mean, we managed to flip quite easily um, online. So on the Thursday when it was announced, all schools and colleges had to close. I think the, the announcement was made just around, just before lunchtime and, and the campus had to be closed by 6 p.m. Um, we were able to turn it around quite quickly that we didn't even have to cancel any classes on that day. So there was three lectures. Michael actually was one of them um, that were due to take place that evening after 6 p.m. And they all happened online. Um, and there was an all day lecture um, on the Friday and, and that managed to happen online as well. Um, so we were able to flip it, but I mean, certainly, um, I mean, in the past, when I, I've worked on things like new program development, you might get resistance in terms of things like, well, will we do it blended? Will we do some online? Um, and lecturers have been worried about teaching online and, and feel that it, it loses some of its value. But then, what do you call it, Mark? A crisis unity? Once crisis we, unity, yeah. Crisis yeah. unity. We just had yeah, to do it yeah. and we did. Yeah, I do think, you know, in, in a way, this is kind of forced on us in Griffith. I mean, I've done a little bit of work with the Open University, who, you know, kind of has a a very, very long, they've been online since day one, effectively, in, in a different format of online. Uh, and the more time you have to think out the possibilities and the different ways of doing it, etc., cetera, um, the better it is. And I would sort of say, you know, coaching training is a little bit different than teaching, you know, because I would have been involved in that in the past. Uh, online one-to-one -one coaching works quite well, you know, because you're in a one-to-one a -one situation, you're using a Zoom, you're getting most of the signals back that you need to kind of interact with people body language wise, you know, but none of you have any idea. I could be wearing clowns pajamas and runners <laughs> under the table here and you can't see that, you know, I, I don't, but, <laughs> but you know, you are missing a little bit if you do things online. Mm -hmm. And I would sort of say um, training with small groups of people, six, eight people online is very, very difficult. There is no great replacement for the social interaction that you have with a group of people around a, a boardroom table or in a small room kind of sharing ideas or if they want to go sticking post-its or flip charts on the wall that type of thing very hard to recreate that online not impossible but you certainly do lose something and i think as long as you're upfront about that and say look it's not the ideal but it's as near as we can do it and get yourself really really good software to do it as well um you know we're using zoom at the moment there are other products out there in the market that are more um, more suited, I would say, sort of training and one-to-one -one consulting and coaching. Uh, so maybe investigate the technologies. And that might mean spending a little bit more money and spending a little bit more money on good microphones and good earphones and all of that type of good quality video camera, all that type of thing. If you're going to do it, um, research it and do it properly. It's not high cost, and most of the stuff can probably be bought online if you need to get set up if you don't already have it. But don't just assume that you can kind of plug your earphones into a smartphone and off you go. Um, it, it isn't going to work that way. I, that would be my advice, kind of from 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 my experience. Yeah. Podrick, do you have any thoughts on that? Can online replace face to face? Uh, well, I've written one book and I'm writing the second one on all of the mistakes I made because they all wouldn't fit into one book <laughs> when Mark just mentioned books there earlier. And I'd say the first mistake I made was I didn't get coaching. I didn't realize the importance of coaching. It's absolutely up there. And it's important that I, I believe that online coaching is really, really good. It can be really good. I think the bottom line is who is coaching you? And whether they're doing it physically face-to-face -face or electronically face-to-face, -face, yeah, there's a bit of a difference. It's always nicer to be physically face-to-face -face with somebody. But I cannot emphasize strongly enough the importance of good coaching and that you will, like, I might get on well with somebody who'd be coaching me and somebody else may not get on well with that coach. It doesn't mean it's a bad coach. It just means we're different people. Yeah. because it's very much interpersonal so uh yeah i'd support online coaching i'd support coaching overall i don't think we do enough of it i think we should do more of it and online is a great opportunity to develop it mm -hmm. 
It's, a, it's, it's interesting what you say there. I can remember a few years ago doing some coaching myself. I did a little bit of training with Chambers of Commerce and someone came up as a succession planning session. Uh, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I really want you as my coach and, you know, you'd be great and you'd give all this kind of advice. And I, I, I felt like saying to him, like, you know, I might be a great coach for you, but you're not going to be a good client for me. <laughs> we just didn't see eye to eye. And I could kind of say, I'd meet this guy three or four times. And after, you know, and our fourth meeting would be when we'd had the fallout. <laughs> you know, that's when we were coaching. He didn't yeah. see that yet. I was ahead of him in terms of seeing it. It works both ways, you know. It works um, both But ways. it's absolutely, you have to have that rapport and everything, you know. And you also have to be honest, you have to say if it's not working out, look, it's not absolutely. working. Absolutely. Uh, we both need to step away from this. And I think most mm -hmm. professional coaches are sensible enough that they realize that, you know, there are different personalities and all that type of thing. Um, it's not it's not one course for every horse type of thing, you know? Okay. That's brilliant. Um, guys, we leave it there. Darren did want to know if you could give any pointers, Mark, on the types of tech. So I suppose examples of the other um, software that you can use in terms of coaching and training and, and communication. Well, just um, very quickly, a couple like Adobe Connect can be used, but GoTo Training is one that I've come across recently, which I found good. Hmm. I've used it a I've couple of times. as well, yeah. Um, I think it's quite good. And it also suits groups as well as individuals. It can go quite big. But I think it works very, very well with small groups and one-to-ones. Mm. And, -one um, and it can do a lot of the things like record sessions and all that type of thing that, that you need to do. And it's just a kind of bit of a step up from Zoom. I suppose it was kind of, it was designed for training rather than mm. broader education or, or, or just holding meetings. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one that I would look at. So go go-to training. Go-to training. I, I've, I've, no I've, what it costs, but you've used it, yeah. I've used it as well, and I actually don't know the costs either. Um, <laughs> I, I think I've probably used it through the same... Um, place as you um but i would uh, yeah have definitely have a look at it i mean i i think zoom is possibly a little bit more intuitive in terms of user friendliness yeah. Mm -hmm. um yeah. but in terms of functionality as you say it's definitely one to have a look at um okay so we have gone a little bit over time but i i hope nobody minds too much because i think the the richness of that content um the advice the insights um the inspiration really a lot of the comments that are coming through are just we could sit and listen to you guys all day um, and getting so much advice and enjoying it. Um, so I do think, you know, it's, it's been worth the extra seven or eight minutes. Um, so all that remains for me to say really is a, a massive thank you to Podrick and to you, Mark, um, for joining us today. You did a lot of talking um, and, and a lot of off the cuff stuff. So I really put you um, under pressure there at times. So thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you. Yeah, you're Walter Road. Thank and you. Paul. Thanks a million, Eilish and Mark. Good talking to you. And, Great to uh, talk to you. I hope, I hope, I hope everybody enjoyed and benefited from uh, the interaction, and that they continue to make the world a better place with them than without them. So, go to meet Margaret. Absolutely. Long Thank forward. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank, Thank you, Mark. You. And Thank just you. a reminder to all of our participants that we do have a bonus webinar tomorrow morning, um, which is being facilitated by JP from Sovi.com. So, hopefully, you'll be able to join us at 10:30 tomorrow for that. The invitation will be sent later this evening, um, and that is going to be on all things GDPR compliance and data protection. Uh, so, hopefully, see you all in the morning. Take care and stay safe. <laughs>